Welcome to another episode of Indie Comic Exchange. We are joined by Adam <clears throat> Lemna from the Relic Hunter, uh, a very, very excellent comic and something we have been um, very much chatty about. I should say I'm very, very chatty about it because of its sword and sorcery base, um, you know, from, from tradition. But uh, we just want to thank and welcome Adam for joining us this Sunday morning. Adam, how are you doing? Doing great, guys. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super stoked. Well, yeah, we're thanks glad for to have you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, we, what we do is, um, you know, we keep these about 45 minutes and uh, we always start off with, you know, tell us a little bit about you. But when we were inter, um, interviewing um, Eli, I had made, I had made a little joke that when we were interviewing you, I might as well just bring us back to the back matter because, and, and I want to repeat, I, I yeah. want to repeat, I want to repeat, like, you're going to give us some like little juicy bits about how you get into comics and, 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 and definitely Relic Hunter, but this is an amazing story right in itself. So, you know, another absolute reason to buy this comic. So, uh, but please go ahead and give us your, your uh, short you. abbreviated version and getting in. Yeah, sure. Um, so I've been creating comics for about, I guess, like, like a year or so. Um, I really started during the pandemic. Um, I had a lot of free time and I was working from home, so I didn't have like a long commute. I'm a, I'm a film editor uh, and television editor um, as well. And uh, so I had all this time and I'd been watching Cartoonist Kayfabe for, I don't know, a couple of years or so. And so I really... I just started drawing every day because I had the time and I started really putting some effort into it. And after about a year of creating stuff, I created some stories and, uh, and some images that I liked, but I wanted to, um, to work on something longer. And, uh, I spoke with the guys over at next panel press, um, and decided to release it with them because I felt like, you know, one, one page every two weeks was something that I could handle as a, uh, as an artist with a day job, right, you know, it's not right. always, uh, easy. And, uh, and so I started out, I mean, you know, my favorite, my favorite books are, you know, I'm a big savage sort of Conan fan. Those, those books from the seventies for me, um, heavy metal, um, Conan saga, you know, the, the Warren magazines, all that kind of stuff is really close to my heart. And it's really, um, exciting to me in terms of, uh, the imagery. Like I, I love the artists in there and, uh, I wanted to pay homage. I'm also, uh, you know, a big fan of like D and D and heavy metal album covers and stuff like that. So I knew that I wanted to set something, um, sort of in a sword and sorcery type of world, but I didn't want it to be like completely divorced from reality, at least at the beginning. And, uh, and so that's sort of how I came up with the concept for Relic Hunter. And then I just sort of started drawing stuff. And I mean, I had a very rough outline at the beginning for what the story was going to be that I added to as I was going through and, and, and creating the pages I created four or five pages. I can't remember um, before I started releasing them on Next Panel Press. Um, and it just, it, it got to be really, really fun. And I it, I just really enjoyed not only the process of making the art, but also telling the story, figuring out the best way to tell the story. And also, you know, in, in the book, as you can see, there's all sorts of like after Buscemas and stuff like that. So, you know, like, I, I wanted you everybody are to know. Channeling. I mean, that is. Oh, thank you, man. I think everybody, everybody I've talked to about the book, um, their their reaction is exactly what you just, um, you know, did the little rundown of you know, from Savage Sword yeah. to Heavy Metal Dungeons and Dragons, but you have been able to channel that. And, and, and it's around one character 
And can you expand upon this character and the world and that being? Oh yeah, character? absolutely. Yeah. Um, so his name is his name is Asif Ibn Ibn Hamza, um, and uh, he is a uh, he's a warrior who has studied um, dark magic. Let's put it that way, and um, was you know you begin to get some of the the backstory in the book as the book. Uh, goes on, but I necessarily wanted him to start sort of like in the middle. Um, I wanted it to feel like you'd picked up, you know, like a a book that was that you already knew the background of the of the character. And so the beginning of the story is very simple and very action packed. And then I wanted to take a break a little bit later and and bring in some of the backstory. But you know, his backstory was that he was you know he was a mercenary um, in. Uh, in the Middle East during the Crusades. And uh, a lot of this also will be covered in um, in books that are coming, issue two, issue three. I'm working on those with, uh, with Manny Gomez um, and really excited, a uh, lot of really cool stuff. But anyway, he was a mercenary. Uh, he was nearly killed. He was brought to this monastery and uh, this, this nun brings in this this dark master of magic who saves his life and gives him this power. And once he has this power, he wants to go and, you know, years later, he wants to get back the woman he loves and he wants to, um, you know, use that power to start, you know, living his life and creating a name for himself and that sort of thing. And I also wanted there to be a backstory uh, you know, with with uh, Oladuo, his uh, his nemesis, the evil wizard, who I was really excited. I mean, like, I don't know, like, just creating this was so much fun for me because yeah. it was just like it, it was just a chance to study all of the books that I love, all the stories that I love, distill it down into something that was sort of simple and easy to tell, but that I could tell in an artful way. And that I could then take in like crazy and psychedelic directions. <laughs> uh, yep. So I, I wonder if it's um, intentional, but Kurt, if you can go back like uh, to the, to the maybe like second or third page, every time you have these, um, yeah, go back, 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 back. Um, oh, that's the second page. Oh, okay. Yeah. So go for it. It seems like when you have these side views, right? Profile views right there. Um, it's like kind of like Egyptian. Was that was that something that was intended? <laughs> Absolutely, man. I mean, oh, like I, I studied. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I studied um, archaeology uh -huh. also in college, as well as uh, filmmaking. I was a double major for a while, and eventually I dropped uh, archaeology just because I, I I felt like I had to focus on one, and I felt more affinity for filmmaking. But um, I've always been a huge huge history buff and, and fan. And I love the imagery of um, ancient Egyptian art and the style and all of that. And I thought that it was very compelling, um, at least the coal around the eyes, very compelling as like, sort of like goth imagery, but also like rock and roll and heavy metal. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that, yeah. that's the kind of thing, like when I was designing the character and you can see the design of the character evolving um, as the book goes on too. That's the other thing is like, I, I, I wanted, you know, when I sat down with Eli to put the book together, there was some discussion about whether or not I was going to redraw anything um, from earlier on to match more of the, the art style of later. And I decided ultimately against it because I wanted people to see my art, evolving the same way that I did. And I think that that's part of the draw of the book that people see, you know, how, how, how far I've come in. And I just, it's just because I draw every day, man, you know, like, mm -hmm. I don't think I have any like amazing, great skill, except that I'll just sit there for hours and doodle. You know I think, I but mean? I think, I think, I think that is, is very justifiable. And I think the, the other part of it, it is your because you're channeling all this stuff. It's very hard to to really like 
design it that well. But just like Jake picked up, I picked up on it as well. But I, I use it's like a it was like a secondary thing. But for Jake, that was a primary thing. So you're you're giving us everything to kind of and and I even want to add that you know it makes me want to go back and check out you know, uh, uh, Egyptian or Arabian type, you know, black magic pulp stories or comic, you know what I mean? So you're, yeah. you're doing a greater service oh, thank <laughs> you. to our, to thank our you. genre, to our genre of sword and sorcery, yeah. then, then maybe, maybe, maybe the majority of people when they think comics and they come around and they go, Ooh, wow, this guy needs a couple of more years under his belt. I, I just, I just I've been shying away from it, and this book really made me go, "Hey, uh, let's let's get this guy doing this uh, twenty four hours a day, please." <laughs> oh, thank you, I really appreciate that. I mean, I would love to do that. It's uh, you know, this story is really close to my heart because um, it just feels like the sort of like culmination of like you know all the things that I've loved uh, in a big way throughout my life, and I've written a number of screenplays you know unproduced and i've been working in filmmaking for a long time and it it helped me to distill my ideas because i wanted because i i visual storytelling is my whole life you know what i mean it's what i live and breathe and so like it's also been learning to step away from more cinematic storytelling if that makes sense right. even though no, i think that there's a, a cinematic sense to the book, uh, stepping away from that, like to create and to learn to speak the visual language of comic books and to learn the rhythm of the storytelling and, but also to bring what I know about the rhythm of storytelling from filmmaking into comics as well. Um, so like one of the things that I, that I tell people is like, I'll start out with like a, you know, a splash, a splash page like this. And then I'll slowly, I'll break the panels down and then I'll build it up so that there are fewer and fewer panels until we get to like a big moment. And then there's a splash. And it, usually I try and make it a page turn if it's possible. You know, I'm trying to play <laughs> with the editing of the book like like it would be the editing of a film. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, we, we definitely appreciate that because we, we're, we're working on a, a project called B Movie She Devils where we're trying to put movies into comic form. And uh Oh yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So um, you know, it it's funny because you know you don't have sound and you don't have motion, but right. you know, you have pretty much everything else. You know, you could you have dialogue and you have, you know <clears throat> pacing, you have sequencing, you have so much that you can do. Um and there's so much to learn from out there too. Like so many amazing, really well done adaptations of films right. that are out there. I mean, like, um, if you look at like Dune, the Bill Sienkiewicz Dune adaptation yeah. that Marvel did, that's really fantastic. Uh, Kirby's 2001 adaptation, really fantastic. Yeah, some of, I mean, some, uh, really Williams, on the, some of those really get lost on the wayside. Like, I was, I was uh, telling Kurt about the alien. I think it was Walt Simonson did it at the very first alien adaptation, like the year it came out, um, yeah. you know, obviously yeah. Planet of the Apes, you know, over, over the years and, you know, Logan's run, George Perez, you know, there's so, there's been so many that um, turn into comics, but, you know, but having the comic be the movie, you know, be a movie is, is kind of a different thing. So, you know, I, I, we're, we're really surprised because we're both uh, like fans of Russ Meyer, and we're very surprised. Oh yeah, yeah, that there hasn't been more um, comics put out. You know, uh, just of B movies, um, in general. You know, um, I know that the you know Jim Rugg did uh, uh, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, the cover for the Criterion edition yeah, of that. I saw that. I did not. That's, That's really cool, man. Like I, oh, very... I love Russ Meyer films. I'm a big B movie fan. Um, it just like cinematically, like my, uh, I'm a, I'm a huge Kubrick fan. I'm obviously, but I'm also like a huge, uh, Friedkin fan, big, big, big Friedkin fan, big sorcerer. Um, oh my God. I love sorcerer <laughs> so much, 
so that much, dude. Much. <laughs> That's a movie uh, oh. a friend of mine, a friend of mine introduced me to uh, almost 10 years ago. And ever so yeah. often, you know, you have that dream list of movies you'd like to turn into a comic book. That's probably like number three on mine because. Oh my God, that would be, it would lend itself so well to it would, too, man. But oh, how tough, like how challenging because it's in so many like of the nuances of, oh, oh yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but keep going. Sorry, it's man. just such a great, and I mean like, uh, so like, uh, and also films like, I'm a big Abel Ferrara fan. I'm a big Scorsese yeah. fan. You know, uh, it's so uh, for me, I wanted to bring some of that aesthetic as well in a weird way. Um, and then it just sort of like everything. I don't know. It's just a stew, man. Yeah. And uh, I really just enjoy sitting down at the board, coming up with interesting imagery and like challenging myself. That was another big part of this as well for me, because uh, when I started, you know, when I started drawing, I... It, I had been sketching for many, many years, but I hadn't really seriously drawn anything since probably like, like college. And, uh, you know, it was a process of learning and relearning, uh, figure and, and form and that kind of stuff while also thinking about it from a comics perspective, because yeah. I think Frank Miller is the one that said that the comics are, are when you go, when you take, the figure and you expand it beyond regular proportions you know what i mean when you push yeah it expressive sort of like expressive a, uh you know uh, anatomy um exactly yeah, but we're we're in a much free freer time you know after after raw has been out and after all the 90s totally. magazines did the things and those power comic guys that are going back to look at all these rare things that, you know, might've been very stylized at, and, and weren't recognized at the time, you know, um, you know, we, we were interviewing a couple of artists uh, so far in this series that um, have very stylized uh, versions of art. You know, you don't want to say cartoony, you want to yeah. say, you know, stylized, but um, you know, you got the influences of the street art, you got the in influences of the primitive art, um, you have the influences of ancient uh, stuff and uh, it's, you know, it all comes out and, and then within all that, you got to set yourself apart <laughs> from everybody else. So. <laughs> oh, totally. It's really interesting because for a long time, I, you know, I, I struggled with kind of figuring out what my quote unquote style was until I had a conversation with a friend of mine and he, he said to me, you know, like your style is what happens when you make a mistake. Right. That's you know great, what I mean? And good friend that is, yeah, but that's like, that, that is so true. Like, and then once you can once you can stop thinking about creating something consciously, then it becomes a good thing. Uh, like the unconscious comes to the fore and you, and yep. you begin to have your own style. And it's really interesting. I think you can see that begin to develop over the course of this book. I'm really proud of it. It's it's interesting because I you know there are some drawings where I I cringe when I look at it now, but then I'm also like, well, that's where I was at the time, and that's what I wanted was warts and all. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah definitely. Because I enjoy seeing that. I'm a big nerd for that kind of stuff. Well, you know, you have there's a lot of you have you have some very very expert things going on, whether you know it or not. I'm looking at the spread here. Um, you know, the balance of white and black um, and, you know, m medium tones or, you know, or drafting techniques that give you, you know, an interplay. Um, it's, you know, it's a great balance here, you know, and uh, that's what I try to Thanks, teach my man. students. You know, you have to like look away and then look back at it and say, OK, do I have too much, you know, black loaded up on one side? Am I distributing yeah. gray tones here? Um, you know, you also have a lot of, uh, you know, intense storytelling here. You got violence, you have science fiction, you have um, a, a real, yep. like, you know, expressiveness, you know, that reminds you of the Japanese, you know, way that they, oh, that they you. always like, you know, exaggerate expressions, right? You have to really play it up. Um, you got a lot of, uh, you know, diagonals cutting, cutting your page, you know, from being like, you know, uh, stayed. Um yeah, yeah, and this is just one spread. I mean, you know, really, really great eye candy here. 
I really appreciate so, that, man. And you know, part of it, I have to be honest with you guys, is because I'm in Next Panel Press, and we have we have a, a Facebook Messenger group that we're on, and we talk all the time, and we share work with one another. We oh, wow. talk about our lives. We talk about what we're into, what we're watching, what we're reading, all that kind of thing. And for me, being able to have that kind of sounding board. And to have all of that experience together in one, uh, you know, it's the most invaluable thing. I mean, I treasure those guys more than I can possibly ever express because it's it's iron sharpening yeah. iron. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And when you have, like, I, it's very rare that you're able to find a group of people artistically that you can, like, be friends with for a long time because artists especially comic book artists tend to be pretty introverted and and quiet and you know people who work by themselves that that is part of the appeal i think at least in my case and um it's really rare and and i you know i i credit them a lot because i share probably more than i should (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> of process with them <laughs> but uh but i really enjoy getting the feedback from them um because uh i'm pretty open about the fact that i'm not like you, you know that i'm learning even while i'm doing it i'm learning and i'm trying to like uh apply that level of uh craft that i don't really have yet that i'm that i'm striving for um at all times and sometimes i need to take a step back and they've really you know, some of the advice that they've given me has helped me to like refocus and and make the book yeah. better in the long run. Um, so I want to just interject a sword and sorcery nerdy segment here because this is this this story. When I open the page and I get Hell yeah, Fox boy. over Hellep, uh, Alep, yeah, man. right? I went. Wait a second. Wait a second ran to my back my back stock and i pulled this out and of course this is absolutely (laughs) one of my favorite it's one of my favorite comics and i'm saying like comic for so many reasons so many reasons but i want you to unpack for me um where this comic is that doorway into this this comic because um I'm I'm just I'm just completely um, uh, taken by it. it. It's just go ahead. Well, I'll tell you, man. Um, you know, I keep right next to me at all times not only my issues but also my nice. my dark horse books, and I've taken them out. But um, as you can see, I keep tons of hey, paper thanks, inside for right. marking pages. And um, this is what I do, man. I mean, like, I'm a huge pulp uh, story fan, but I love the the character of Conan. I've always loved the character of Conan. And since I was in college, it's actually really funny. When I was in film school, I um, I wrote a whole paper about uh, the original uh, Conan the Barbarian film by John Milius. Oh yeah, and oh, yeah. Uh, it, it's. To me, he's such an important character. So I've spent many, many years collecting uh, Savage Sword and um, just enjoying reading it. And I uh, I won't say that I have like an encyclopedic knowledge of it, but I, I tend to mark the, the stories that I love. And Alfredo Acala is my favorite oh. Yusema anchor. Um, <laughs> and I think that their stories are far and away the most um compelling um imagery of of conan uh at least to me that's the most iconic maybe that maybe that's how i should say because i love barry windsor smith and i love gil kane and you know i love you know when you see like joe jusco doing like uh stuff later on and like you know there are different eras of conan that i that i really love but for me it's always going to be busema and alcala because that to me that's the when I imagine the world. That's how I imagine it. I don't know if it's like I don't know if I it's like. Well, we uh, have a we have a like, trope that we keep going back to, and, and it seems to hold. Um, it's the it's the twelve year old um syndrome, right? Like whatever, 
<laughs> whatever you yes. were, whatever you were when it's twelve. Because I, I was, I was maybe like eleven or ten or eleven when John. I was getting John Ramita Spider Man, you know, for twenty five cents. Yep. So it's, for me, Ramita is always the guy. But of course, Ditko is the guy. I mean, you know, how can you, how can you yeah. not? But, but you know, I think it's like. You know, kind of like a longingness for the carefree time of youth that we associate, you know. Totally. <laughs> right? So, we're... yeah, man. And I, I mean, as far as Hawks over Shem goes, you know, this is such an iconic image to me. I mean, like, yeah. and it's such a great way to start a story, right? Yeah. You know, he's walking into the city and you get the name there on the wall and you, this whole image tells a story, you know what I mean? And that's what I wanted to do and mine as well. And I wanted immediately, I wanted an image that people were going to know. So the fact that you knew it, that makes oh. me really happy because it was like, I want you to understand from the very beginning. And this is why I used uh, a homage at the very beginning yeah. yep. was to sort of wear my, um, my influences on my yeah. sleeve for a moment and, and let you know what what's coming in this book, you know? And I also, you know, I've read how to, you know, how to draw comics the Marvel way and all that, mm -hmm. you know, the philosophy behind putting a splash page as your first page, you know, setting the story that way. And, you know, sometimes I, it, it's funny because I really love this piece. I look back at it and I, I cringe at some of the things in it, like the figure work just, I feel like isn't there yet and everything, but I, I'm, I, but I'm happy. I love it. You know, but it is I, what I, it is. The fact that you, you have it's the now it's the back of the knight's head, and this just yes. it's black shape in a black shape, and I know that this is a knight's templar. Like I know, you know, that's where I'm heading. The all the 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 the, the change, if you will, or the reestablishment because of your story, the architecture, and then just even this crown. And the little, yeah. you know, the little river of sewage through the city and everything. I loved like, that about the image. I was like, this is so like. So, I know. But but this is the point about me. For me and comics, it's got to be dirty in every dimension yes. of the word. It's got to be filthy. And you can't sanitize sword and sorcery. I just have no. No, not at all. You don't want. That. You want that world to be lived in and gross. Yeah. And that's why people, yeah. I mean, that's why people respond to alien. That's why people respond yeah. to star Wars. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and I feel like that's why so many more people respond to that than say like star Trek or something like that, which is more stylized and sanitized because, yeah. and I love star Trek. Don't get me wrong. Like I'm a huge star Trek nerd as well as star Wars nerd and everything else. But I have always preferred the lived in world that feels oh, like, it, you know, there are things happening on the other side, outside of the frame. Yeah. And that's something you're taught in filmmaking as well as to like, remember the world outside of the frame. Yeah, that's that's what we're definitely doing with our uh, properties here. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I so, mean, and from what I can see of the of your book, I mean, like, guys, I can't even tell you how excited I am for it. I mean, oh, you it's will. like- You will at the end, at the end. Yes, that's our, that's our last thing. But the, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay, I okay, get, okay. Well, hold I on. Get yeah, in, yeah. I want to get into the next set. The next segment is where we talk about promotion. But excellent. You're 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 um being um, uh, you know, you're published by uh, Cosmic Lion, which is Eli Schwab, yep. and we had he he was our first interview for 2024, and it was so great to have you guys um, you know, get scheduled uh, uh, for this because. For Jake and I, we're doing the channel for two reasons. One reason is to just document our process, only being able to work every Sunday together. The sure. second part of it, yeah. the second part of it is we need to learn. We've been out of the game for twenty something years, um, you know, and and it's like, why not use technology to communicate with other people? So here yeah, we're set. We're we're this is a setup where we get to hear the publisher's reason for publishing. Uh, Relic Hunter, but now we get to hear the artists um, and creators version of why Cosmic Lion, because obviously Cosmic Lion is doing the lion's share of the of the promoting. So take it away. Yeah, 
Well, yeah. Um, so I knew Eli um, through Next Panel Press and through the the CKRS uh, Ringside Seats Facebook group. And um, initially, I went to Eli and I, because he had done um, several Kickstarters, and I talked to him about it. And uh, because I was going to kickstart the book, and I was yeah. like, you, you know, I, I want to pick your brain, and. Yeah. Um, and we talked about it and along the way, it just seemed to make more sense to me to put it out with Eli through Cosmic Lion because he was putting, because he was starting an imprint because to me, it felt important and I felt really grateful and honored to be able to be a part of Cosmic Lion because I feel like, um, Everybody that Eli brings in is super talented and I feel really grateful to be part of that. And um, when we sort of decided that, that that's what we were going to do. Um, and I, and I said to him, you know, I would really like to, uh, but I wasn't sure. And I don't know if he was really a hundred percent sure yet. Um, you know, he was like, he was like, yeah, man, I'd, I'd love to do it. Let me see what you got when you've got the book put together and uh and i said yeah that, that sounds great so uh when i finally finished the the last the last page <laughs> like the same day i started putting together the pdf and um and just started playing with you know some of the stuff because obviously i still needed i needed uh the cover and i needed a back cover and and all these sort of things. And so I had talked to a bunch of people about, we're looking at the pinups now. I had talked to everybody along the way. So I had had people sending me pinups. Um, and I was really excited. Oh my God, I have such an incredible group of people that were able to do this for me. I mean, you know, Tony Wolf and Alex Delaney, uh, Anton William Blake, um, you know, Ken Landgriff, <laughs> you know, like yeah. mind blowing, yeah, yeah. you know, and, uh, so a definite influence. Oh yeah, absolutely. Are you kidding me? I mean, New York Outlaws mm -hmm. um, is yeah. incredible, man. I mean, Ken's incredible. His work is so expressive and so it's so different than any other comic art that you're ever going to see. And he paid me the highest compliment when he did this. He told me that he really liked the characters and he really enjoyed doing the piece. And that meant so much to me because it's like, ah, like if I can engage Ken Landgraf, Ken Landgraf, then, you know, maybe I have a chance of engaging, yeah. you know, some other folks as well. That's a good point. And uh, <laughs> so anyway, I put together the PDF and I sent it to, uh, to Eli in a rough form. And, you know, I spent the weekend um, sort of like worried. <laughs> that he was gonna be like yeah it's great dude but i don't want to do it yeah. <laughs> you know? and i was like totally prepared to be like all right i'm just gonna do a kickstarter then he came back and he really liked it and uh and so we we put it in we you know i mean it took some time to to go through and edit everything and then you know go through the process of printing which is you know very important to me. I had very specific ideas about how I wanted the book to look and to feel and um, what size I wanted it to be. Um, I have to credit Eli with uh, with pushing for the for the larger format, which I which I'm really glad that he did. I, yes. I, I wasn't sure initially if it was going to be too much. Um, obviously, I love the aesthetic of it, but you know, I also wanted it to be accessible to people. And so like, you know, uh, but Eli, Eli definitely was, you know, he was like, this is a savage sword homage. We have to do it. And yeah. I was like, you're right. It, it has to be this way. It has to be good, this way. Good call. Um, and uh, the paper I had spent a long time. I'm a huge um, Baxter paper fan. Um, so I spent like months uh, researching back Baxter paper and what the best paper, the, uh, the, the, the best paper that is the closest to what Baxter paper is, because I don't know if you guys have ever looked into it, but, uh, it was, uh, it was a text paper. Um, and so it, it has a different, a, a different type of feel and it absorbs color and imagery 
in a slightly different type of way. And actually the last of the Baxter paper, this is not Baxter paper. This is, this is the paper that uh, I actually, we ended up going with comics wellspring mm -hmm. and I'm really happy with the way that the printing turned out. They did a really fantastic job. Um, so shout out to them. And uh, you know, but I spent a long time. And when I did the, when I wanted to choose the paper for this, I had, found a place called French paper in Michigan, uh, which does a, uh, like a higher, it's like a higher grade newsprint. Mm -hmm. Um, and they said it's called, du it's either duotone or durotone, something like that is it, by French paper out of Michigan. And, uh, you can buy, you know, like 500 sheets of it. And I use that for my ash can. And that is this higher grade aged newsprint. So I wanted it to have this aged look and, the cream paper that that uh, Comics Wellspring had was nice and thick and and luscious and had that creamy texture and, and color. So I'm totally nerding out on paper. No, it's you, no. not at all. No, you're <laughs> you're talking to the at least with Jake and I, you're talking to the right people. Yeah, I I, <laughs> yeah. I have a degree in graphics before they before the digital age. So I I learned all that stuff, paper making and um you know the, yeah. the best paper shops in new york city at the time and um it, uh, you know it's it's great to to have pre-aged paper because you know then you know what is it going to look like you know after it actually ages I, that's going to be an interesting question and yeah. um well it's all the aesthetic too man i mean like you know i want it to be a complete experience when you when you pick it up i want it to feel like an out of place object you know what i mean yeah <laughs> Uh, right. like, it, like it's something that you found in a, in a dollar bin, um, from well, that, that, that's an artifact from 20 years ago. Yeah. Cause you know, oh, I, well, I, 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 I live in that same kind of world where, you know, the thing about aging yeah. of these magazines is how it gets darker on the edges yeah. and then it, it, yep. it, you know, it migrates in and everything. So I have a book I'm working on where I'm playing around in Photoshop on how to, how to kind of like patina, that kind of thing. But then at the same time, it's like, well, don't I just want it to kind of just be, you know, aged on its own. So seeing this sure. book 50 years from now, seeing this book from now, and then the, that 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 uh, darkening because of, uh, you know, the elements, uh, you know, and, and this would only be because I didn't bag and board the, the comic, right? It's just silly. <laughs> It's just, you know, these, yeah, are, all sitting, you need these are all sitting in the basement in, a, in, a, in the same yeah. box I bought all of them in when I was 14 Listen, years man, old. I'm, the, I'm not a slabbing type of guy. I don't, I believe oh, no, in, no. I believe in living yeah. comics. You know what yes, I mean? Like yes. comics are alive. They need to breathe. They need to be out. They need to age. And when they fall apart, that's okay. Yeah. You know, that's a sign of a loved, heavily loved comic. And I got to yeah. tell you, man, I absolutely love the work that Rick did for this backup story. Yeah, Rick and Manny yeah. did such an incredible <laughs> job. And Rick's art is just so wild, dude. Yes. And has the cartooniness of it. I, I love the I, just everything about it. You know, it's really exciting to me. The, the layouts are really good because we had talked about, um, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but we had spoken about... Um, one of the Conan books that I really love is this book right here, this Marvel graphic novel. I don't know if you've read oh, it. Oh, wow. Yeah. This is yeah. Um, really, really cool. And uh, written by Doug Munch and uh, art by uh, Paul Glacey. Oh, wait, that's and, the Master of Kung um, Fu team. Yeah, yeah. man. Doing and, Conan. Uh, you know, you can see, I, I had long talks with Rick about it, you know, and so you can see some of the, ways that rick was homaging that art as well and i mean like you get to see galacy doing conan it's just like amazing to me ah, yeah. like I, oh, yeah. i'm such a huge fan and i'm a huge you know i'm a huge deadly hands of kung fu fan and yeah, uh you know this is the type of stuff that i don't know when i was growing up like my friends older brothers <laughs> you know what I mean? And like at the comic book shop in the back of the comic shop where the adult comics are, you know, yeah, exactly. like that's where I loved hanging. Yeah. Out, you know what I mean? That's yeah. That's the stuff that I thought was really cool. So. Yeah, that 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 team like really uh 
they they really were a one-two punch. Galici and uh, and Doug Mensch. I met Doug Mensch when I was a little kid working at a comic store, oh. and then I think he guest appeared at the Denny O'Neill uh, writing comics class at School of Visual Arts. Um, it was him and Mantlo. So uh, we I think we. we yeah, we oh, heard wow. both, we heard from both of them, and uh, you know, just great experienced guys. You know, they played around with so many yeah. Marvel characters, and you know, I, I, I to me the 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 writing and and the um, storytelling of you know that Master Kung Fu run is that's my that's like my number one favorite thing of that and Commandy, you know, maybe, but oh man, it's such a sweet spot for storytelling and art. And it the the way the the way that they melded together was so classic, man. It was like watching a Bruce Lee movie every time. And and a, and a Double O Seven movie at the same time. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That yeah. and um, yeah, you, you know the characters, movies. the worlds, the um, you know they had very interesting like um duality, you know, uh, from from page yeah. to page, panel to panel. They really just advanced writing styles that everybody should be um kind of like trying to pick up on and then they get to like a certain year and the estate of uh fu manchu says no more and then they just completely have to drop yeah. it and write him out of the story so you know wh whatever they're whatever they're doing now with shang chi i'm just i've completely lost interest yeah it's uh, you know i mean like there's been a, a hard turn away from that stuff it's really difficult to get deadly hands of kung fu really anymore so uh, unless you're going to like back his yeah. hands because i, I don't I even think a for a while coverless. i don't know if it's still gone from i got yeah. i got to put a couple coverless uh a couple weeks ago <laughs> i bought like yeah, you know, yeah. i was like i'll take it you know forget it oh man Chris i'm so Cameron, lucky Michael i live Bowman, in, a, in a town. all the big names were in those were in those magazines and they were and that was like literally like their peak as well you know like they were creating some of the most interesting commercial comics that had ever right, come they, out before at least and they opinion. weren't constrained by the comics code because they were in the black and white uh you know like these guys right here we got uh these are deadly hands right here i got uh yeah, jim man. starlin uh len ween dick gordiano sometimes you would have some uh dc guys coming in on these paul galen that's one of the things that I love about about these magazine properties in the 70s is that there was a lot of cross-pollination of yeah. different guys, man. And I also love I love the Filipino artists that you see in yeah. Savage Sword, man. Like yeah. those Filipino artists are incredible. Yeah, dude. my guy is my guy's Rudy Nebras. Uh he's Oh just, man. He's yeah, just man. Kind of like psychedelic, you know, stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. They just did, they really brought an entirely different, almost like more painterly look to the inking style. Yeah. And it, it was, it, it, it's really to me like you learn so much about how to do ink washes from looking at that stuff. Yeah. They would have uh, like new uh, Alcala and ne never, they had their like, um, and Ernie, Ernie, there was Ernie Chan and Ernie Chan. Ernie Chan. Yep. Yeah. There was two Ernie's. But, um, they like I think when Nebras, it's like a kind of patterned stroke effect. When he was doing like you're doing the strokes on an arm or a leg or something, he had this patterned way of doing it. It was like contoured, you know, really just really unique. Cool. We we got to do an episode one day just on Rudy Nebras, but but oh, uh, dude, I would love to come on and talk about <laughs> Filipino artists with you. All right, that would be right. awesome. Yeah. So let me let me keep this moving along, and we have a second to last segment, which is the big question. Adam, what is the future of comics? Uh, the future of comics. Uh, that, I mean, I don't know if I'm really qualified to answer that, but I, from my perspective, the future of comics is going to continue to be uh, more and more uh, decentralized. Um, I think the time of Marvel and DC and monolithic publishers is sort of gone. Yeah. And I think that the comic book industry is going through the same sort of decentralization that the music industry went through 25 years ago. Um, and I think that we're going to see more and more 
and better indie comics and indie publishers coming along, uh, creating the things that are most interesting and important. Not that DC and, and I mean, I think that everybody will want to read Batman and Spider-Man comic books as long as there are people because they're compelling characters. They're interesting. They're almost archetypal at this point. So they're endlessly reinventive and, you know, there will always be a place for that, I think, but the time of uh, the dominate, the domination of monolithic uh, publishing houses, I think that's over because you don't, it's easy to make a book now yeah. and it's easy to distribute a book now you know what i mean like there's not like all the things that were difficult before it's come have to been made yeah. so much like you only need two people at this point you need i feel i feel very strongly about having an editor and you need a creator artist you know and the more people that you want to bring in that's fine and i think that's great that's why for Relic Hunter 2, I have done, I've brought on more people. I, you know, I brought on Manny Gomez to write the story with me. Uh, and I have, I'm working with an editor and I'm working with uh, another artist uh, who's giving me pointers on layouts and things. Um, and I'm really excited about the collaboration um, and the way that it's helping me grow as a creator and as an artist. And I think that that is also part of it as well. I mean, uh, small teams making compelling stories and putting them out themselves without the need to pay money to other people. I mean, yeah. that's the way to do it, man. You know, and having, a, you know, you put out three or four comic books and then a trade paperback and you have a, you know, you have a pretty good passive income stream that you can continue to build. You know what I mean? I'm not yeah. to be like too economic about it, but like mm -hmm. we're all adults, you know? Yeah. And if we're talking about the future of the comic book industry, the future of the comic book industry is independence. You know, it always has been, but it's just whether or not it's whether or not you can create a character who's compelling enough to compete on the level of, you know, a, a, of a Spider-Man. And we yeah. saw that it can happen with Image Comics, yeah. you know? Right. Yeah, if you can if you can keep people coming back, you can have a livelihood, you know? And now it's so, it's so interesting because professional artists and professional comic book artists are more accessible than ever. There's more footage of artists being interviewed and talking about the craft and... and yeah. I think that there are, because like when I was a kid, like I, you know, and I've said this several times, I feel like, um, I felt like you had to be able to draw, draw like Neil Adams to yeah. be a comic book artist. You know what I mean? Did, and so he, I never really took it like that <laughs> seriously. Neil Adams discouraged it, more people than he encouraged. <laughs> yeah, very true. Because I'm just like, oh, I'll never be able to draw like Neil Adams. Visually like, I don't, and I vocally. Can draw for, I could draw for a million years and I'd never be that good. And that, or, or I'd never have that kind of polish or like, I'll never be John Byrne. You know what I mean? Yeah. But that's okay because I don't need to be a and B, you know, people, it's so interesting. You know, people, you don't need to have that level of craft to create a story that's going to be compelling to people and that people will want to read. Right. You need to, be able to make you want to make something ultimately i think that's beautiful and aesthetically pleasing but i think that people are much more forgiving the audience is much more forgiving nowadays than they were 20 years ago and much more prone to accept uh different styles now than they were then so i think it's actually a really great time for comics i know a lot of people talk a lot of doom and gloom about comics right now but i think it's actually a really great time because there are really incredible indie artists that are working all over right now. And I mean, like if any of your audience is in the area, you know, uh, the indie creator comic convention is I believe March 9th. And I know a lot of people that are going to be able to be there. And uh, unfortunately I had to cancel because I'm not going to be able to be there. I'm working on a, a show and I just can't get away from it. But um 
There's going to be a yeah, lot of really awesome people there, man. Yeah, I think, I think we're – yeah, I, I'm definitely going to go. I'm not going to table, but I'm going to have a, yeah. have, a, have a little bop around. Oh, man, there's going to be so many great people there. You're going to meet so many amazing artists and creators, so many people that uh, have such passion for mm -hmm. storytelling and for – visual storytelling and um i yeah, just man, hope really that excited. the i hope this event um the the indie comic creator con um is so well received um like the sex pistols were that not only do people go away <coughs> making comics but i want to see more people doing these kinds of conventions in other words Agreed. only creator centric Stop all of yep. this other noisy nonsense because I will never go to another yep. comic book convention unless it's SPX or the Indie Comic uh, Con, which I will unfortunately be able, will not be able to go. Um, but we'll make it as soon as the date goes, get on, on, on my calendar. Um, but, you know, it, it is just to add... Um, you know, there's no more gatekeepers, but I think the, the other thing that we're all experiencing and it's a great time to get involved um, and making your own stuff is the attention is fighting, if you will, for the attention. And once again, going back to Jake and I, Jake came up with the concept of us doing the podcast only to keep us um, on, on task. In other words, you Keeping have yourself to accountable show up. is a huge part of it. Yeah. <laughs> you you have to show man. up and you got to record and you got to, you know, I handle all of this uh, podcasting stuff, which is fine because it pairs with my um, online marketing um, um, business. But I never, in the beginning, I never really understood why somebody would do this other than to be like, let's say the, 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 um, uh, like a Johnny Carson show or, or Letterman, you know what I mean? Like you're, you're yeah. the one that topically is sitting, but I now find it to be a Jake, Jake, um, I think would, does agree with me on this is your community building. You're really oh, yeah. drawing. We have, I can literally say we probably have more than a dozen people that are very much looking forward to all the things that we put out in the way oh, yeah. uh, of, of our, of our content, but they engage with us. I mean, now yep. I have like, I'm working with two people, um, you know, who just said, Hey, I'm trying to make a comic book. Good look at it. And it's just, I, I think there's just such a, um, you know, commercialism attached to arts that is strangling so many people but when you when you do something and I, I I don't want to put words in your mouth Adam but this book I've read it three times I'm gonna read oh, it just as many you. times I'm just I'm gonna read it just as many times as as I've read this copy you know of uh, of, uh, of sort of Conan because you know it's speaking to my world you know, that, that's, you know, that's sure. the thing and you're contributing to it. Um, and, and with that being said, I just want to move into, because <laughs> the last, the last thing, because, you know, it, it, there's so many similarities between what you're, you've done here and Absolutely. what Jake and I are, are trying to accomplish. And we did the, we set up the Indie Comic Exchange, you know, to basically yeah. get to this point where, um, you know, we, we get you guys to be able to sit down and say, hey, guys, you're at the beginning. Here's your first six pages. Let us have it. <laughs> yeah. No, I, dude, I, I was so blown away when I got this. I mean, literally the day that I received it from you guys, I texted Eli and I was like, you, got, you have to see this. <laughs> Thank you. you have to see this. And I also texted Matt King and I was like, you yeah. got to see this, dude. <laughs> because I knew that those two guys were like, this would be right up their alleys. They would, I mean, I, I don't even know. Like, I can't give you like advice because you're doing it. You're making it. You're making okay. compelling, exciting imagery. I love, I can, I feel like I can see, like I can see influences from the underground, uh, from Spain, Rodriguez, from R. Crumb, <laughs> But also I see like, I see like, you know, air cell books and, yeah. 
you know, I see early Guy Davis and I see, you know, uh, some of the, I see some of the, uh, like, airbrushed books, you know, and I, like Warlock 5 and that kind of, like, this is, to me, one of the most exciting new things. And I love the paper stock that you chose for it. And I love the size that you put it at. I love your character designs. I just, you know, everything about it was exciting to me and felt kindred to what I'm creating. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, I, it, like I've said, I mean, like, I think I've said it to both you guys. It, it, it's, it, this is the kind of book that can only come from uh, seeing other people create this thing and allowing yourself the freedom to create without without restraint you know what i mean and uh, and i love seeing it and it's the action is so good guys the storytelling is good on each page uh i love the i love the the lettering uh, you know it's just the whole package is there and I, i'm just Kind of like, when am I going to get the the final? You know what I mean? That's the thing that I want. And I know yeah. that you guys just put out another, put out a new preview. And I'm We're really excited, but I'm like, I want the whole thing, man. Yeah, yeah, Come yeah, on. Yeah, 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 yeah. We are working on the second one. Jake is, that's what you keep hearing is the tapping is that we need Jake's um, layout for the letters. text blocks. Yeah, man, I'm I'll, seeing. I'll do, I'll do a hand, I'll do the hand lettering and then it'll get all put together. And then we'll put it we'll put it around. But um, you know, it, it we're hearing we're hearing the same thing. And I don't want to say it's kind of surprising to us, but once again, you know, you yeah. know, we're we're from Jake and I are from a generation where you would make no matter how many comic books, you would just bring them somewhere and sell them, and then they would go out yep. into the world. But once again, having this uh, you know, this 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 kind of podcasting culture and having a YouTube channel and such, and then being able to, to invite somebody on who has made, who's already, who's already done it to be able to give us uh, feedback is, is, it's invaluable because you're living in a little bubble um, and making a comic is, is sometimes a glorious thing, but on the other side of it, it can be so terrifying. Um, but thank you for the. Oh, absolutely. The and that's why it's, I mean, that's why I was saying earlier, that's why I treasure the guys in, in Next Panel Press so much, man. Because honestly, like, if I were making comics in a bubble, it wouldn't be as as good as, as it even is, you know? And so I credit that to being able to share the work. And I think that this is a fantastic forum for that kind of thing. And it's great to see somebody who is willing to put their money where their mouth is and their art on display and open themselves yeah. up to criticism because so many people are afraid of criticism and it's the only way that we're going to get better and it's the right. only way that we're going to make stories that people want to hear and it's the only way that we're going to you know face the parts of ourselves that need work you know what i mean whether you know whether it's uh, you know the writing or the figure work or the the backgrounds or the you know you name it you know what i mean yeah 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 you gotta be you gotta be open because um you know uh so you know at the end of the day it's it's all about you know the consumer the fan like you know we love other comics as comic makers we and comic makers might be the biggest consumers of indie comics but at the end of the day <laughs> You're going for, you know, what what is the what is the typical reaction, you know, of the, you know, maybe common, you know, uh, convention goer, you know, buyer, consumer, because, yep. uh, you know, you want you want the stuff to get out there and you and you want to be able to uh, show a profit, you know, even if it's over time yep. um, and uh, and just keep going, you know, so that you can justify more and more and more creation. It's really interesting because, you know, from from my perspective, you can you're not going to make a great profit, but you're going to make some. And um, I mean, printing is pretty cheap now. So, uh, you know, you can price your comic in a way where it's not too expensive, but you can still make some money on it. Um, and uh, there are conventions. I mean, you mentioned SPX that I, I was so lucky to get to table 
at SPX in 2023. And that was such an, inc- I, I, it was the best con experience that I've ever had um, because everybody was there for comics and specifically for indie comics, but everybody was there for comics and they came to buy comics, which is so different than when you're doing, because I also did San Diego Comic-Con last year. Oh, wow. And like, you're, it, it talk about like two different approaches to, uh, it, 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 they could not be different. Like at San Diego, you're one of a million, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Whereas at SPX, you know, it's curated, it's small, and the people that come are interested in comics, not not gaming, yeah. not cosplay, yeah. Yeah. but comics. And so there are a handful of really good conventions um, for indie comic artists. There's obviously SPX, there's Short Run in Seattle, Cake in Chicago, there's uh, CXC in Columbus, Ohio, uh, there's TCAF in Toronto, these are all good shows for uh, for indie comics creators to do because uh, you're getting directly to an indie comics audience. Yeah. And so I would encourage you guys, you know, oh, in yeah. that direction as well. Gonna, gonna um, write them down. Because, yeah, because those are, if I can give any advice, the, the best advice that I can give is, is what I've learned um, actually selling the comic. Um, because I don't think I can give any advice on art that, that better artists couldn't and haven't already given, you know, but from my perspective, selling the comic is as much of an art as creating it. Um, you need to have, you need to have a pitch that you can give people at shows that is concise enough, uh, that they're not going to get tired of listening to you, but also sells your book (laughs) in a really, interesting way i mean like um you also need to know you need to be able to read people it's a there's so much that goes into tabling at a convention and i mean like i've learned you know not to spend too much money for conventions like that was like the first show that i did i made t-shirts and prints and stickers and pins and i had original art and books and da 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 and 75% of that stuff doesn't sell what I sell. And I I can only speak for me because I know that other people have a different sort of thing. But for me, I sell books most prominently and art and prints separately. Those are the other, the other things that I, that I Mm -hmm. sell. And um, you know, it's about choosing the right price point. It's about, you know, interacting with the people that come by and knowing your audience. That's the other thing too. Um, and just getting out there, man, going, I've done in stores, I've done conventions, I've done free comic book days, you know, it's fun, man. I, that to me is like the, one of the most fun parts is getting to interact with other comic book fans. Yeah. You know what I mean? And like, see what other creators have. Um, you know, for example, I met Carl Allstetter, um, at a free comic book day event and um you know we become good friends and he's you know he's given me a lot of advice uh on relic hunter and uh, it's just been really fantastic getting to know somebody with you know 30 years of experience in the comic book field which i never would have gotten if i hadn't done this free comic book day in store you know what i mean so like yeah. you just got to yeah. get out there and you gotta you gotta get to know the people and uh yeah 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 it's been a while we we used to do cons back in the 90s uh you know a lot of a lot of the formats have changed and the audiences are a mm-hmm. little different the technology is all new but uh you know there's still there's people that have been doing it a long time and you know you got your old-fashioned pen and ink guys you know that are still going to be there so it's a lot of fun and uh, i'll say too man it's a big time for black and white comics people love yeah this era of comics i mean like look at floating world man their john tar collection is huge steve mccardle's uh uh vendetta Vendetta. holy vindicator which i recently did a a pinup for him um because I love Steve. He's <laughs> fucking awesome, dude. And Vindicator is, or Vendetta is such a, 
Vendetta is such an incredible character, and that book is so much fun. It's just like, I don't know, man. Like, it's just so close to my heart. And uh, getting a chance to meet him and talk to him and uh, and all that kind of thing. It, 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 really cool, man. So yeah, I just yeah, want to give a evil, shout out to, to Dan, Dan the man over at Rave Sensation, because he, in 2023... Yes did a pickup, had his haul video, had your Relic Hunter in there. And so when he flipped it open, that was, that triggered me. I caught, you know, I contacted him. <laughs> and then, I, then I, I think I, I definitely, th I know I contacted you. Uh, and then, you know, oh, yeah, the, man. The, ball, the ball, the ball started rolling. And then I also want to just make a, a, a thank you shout out to uh, Matt King, who is like one of, Oh, two yeah. people who actually purchased purchased our teaser, uh, which is on my website, KurtBrugel.com. Ah, and so Matt's so the he's best, he's a, <laughs> he's so he's so solid as well as you uh, you yourself and Eli, and we're looking forward to meeting a whole bunch Thank more uh, of, of of incredible creators and collectors and and publishers. But I'm almost out of gas here, Jake. Is you have anything on the outs yeah, for? Um, for us so we can let them let them get back to no uh, just uh, what they do yeah just tell us about uh, number two and where people can pick up uh number one all right well number one is uh always going to be available from uh cosmic lion productions uh website i believe it's i think it's cosmic lion productions.com yeah um, link in the description and uh yes and um so it's always going to be available there i think we're almost out of the first print run so we may be doing a second print run soon i'm not 100 percent sure i have to double check on those numbers but i'm also working on relic hunter 2 right now the script is written uh layouts i'm deep into layouts and uh, i've got some finished art and uh, i'll just tease a little bit for you guys oh um, yes please. and i'll send some images along so Yes. Uh, here is. So that's the uh, here. I'll just do a little. Right. So so this is not digital, right? You're making real nope. old fashioned pen and ink, and that's the size. Those are the plates. Yep, Eleven by seventeen. Um, and yeah, man, I'm using on here. So my process is I'll I'll pencil on Procreate, uh -huh. and then I will create a blue line, and then I ink traditionally. I use tones traditionally, so I cut my own tones. I do my own gray tones uh, traditionally with ink washes and markers and uh, and finish everything. Um, I do. I created a font for Relic Hunter because hand lettering. I hand lettered the first, like, I want to say like 20 pages or so, uh -huh. and I just, it, it kills my hand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um I found this program called Calligrapher, right? Uh -huh. And it's a very yeah, simple program, it. yeah, to create my own font for it. And so that became uh, much more, uh, then I could focus more on the art, you know? Are and you that's, up and that's running with been... your own font already? What's that? You said you're up and running with your own dialogue font already? Yes, sir. There that's you what go. I used for, uh, that's what I used for the final. I went back. That is the one thing that I changed in Relic Hunter after uh, after I'd done the initial, uh, after I'd finished with the art. But before it was printed, I went back and I rewrote some of the dialogue. I rewrote some of the captions and I used the font so that the, so that the lettering matched throughout the book. Right. So folks, you heard it here. These are the tools of the trade. He used a, a, an app called Calligrapher. You can make your own font. You can get up and running doing it. Uh, you know, pretty uh, trouble free. It sounds like, um, you know, that's one of the big complaints with the younger uh, independent comic makers, you know, and, you know, it, it's same thing for me, like this comic project sat there unlettered for years, you know, because, uh, you know, you're just like dreading that part of the, that part of the project. It's hard. It's really hard. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's very easy to make a mistake. Um, it's very easy to misjudge how things are going to lay on the page the right yeah. way 
And so then you're, you're really struggling with it's, I mean, like you can, you can do it on a separate piece and then you can paste it up and, and I've done all of that. Right. So I've done, uh, I've done it traditionally and I've done it non-traditionally. And for me, it just makes more sense to do it non-traditionally with the time constraints that I have with my job and, and all that sort of thing. But uh, I do love um, hand lettering. And I mean, all of the onomatopoeia on the pages um, that I do, that's all done by hand. Um, and all of the uh, like title lettering, that's all done by hand. So you can see like mm -hmm. for Relic Hunter 2, this is the, uh, I'll, I'll tease this again. This is the, the title page. The, the episode, the issue is called yeah. A Dream of Glass and Steel. Oh. And uh, so you got the yeah, marquee there. So that that reminds me of Jeff Darrow, but you also got some Will Eisner because he was the master of, of interplay between uh, graphic tech display text and uh, and storytelling, right? Exactly. And that's sort of like I, I wanted to up the ante. I mean, like I had I had homaged something for the for the title page of of the first book. I wanted to make this something completely original but I also wanted to do it in a way that sort of reminded people of those of crime comics right. from the eighties. And cause I'm, this is my, this is my, we're moving into a supernatural crime comic mixed with a sword and sandal comic. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it is going to be really fun, man. It's going to be really, uh, really, really fun. The script is really good. I love. Do you have a tentative uh, like uh, release date? Do you think it'll be out? Yes, June twenty twenty four is oh, uh, oh, is what right. I'm on the is what I'm aiming for. Oh. So near week, yeah, man, near week. Oh, that's, that's, that's. <laughs> that's the way it feels for sure. Um, but you know, like I said, I have a really great team. Um, I'm not gonna like talk about everybody yet, um, but <laughs> it just really have. Um, well, you know, I don't know if so, you know, I want to make sure that everybody's okay with me talking about them and, and all that sort of thing, because sure. I've had so many people that have, that have given me advice and, and the thank you list is long for Relic yeah. Hunter issue two, man. Um, yeah, no, well, and... you're a, you're a great example of an indie that's getting around, getting into people's hands. Um, you know, um, uh, people should also uh, think really carefully about, you know, uh, the difference between um, doing a Kickstarter and, uh, you know, trying to, uh, you know, sell yourself to a publisher, you know, yep. and, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of difference there, but, uh, you know, this is the modern era that we're in and it's really great to talk to somebody else that's doing it. Also, yes. don't be afraid to go up to people at cons because like I have Relic Hunter, um, in floating world in Portland and I just, I went up to them at SPX. I took my book. I told them, you know, what it is and I gave it to them. And I've had people like send me pictures of it there, you know? And it's like, this is what, like, it's getting out there. You yeah. know, I have it in some stores, um, but mostly just like, you know, a few here and there. My, I, one of the great things I grew up in Maryland, um, about 45 minutes away from Bethesda in a little town called Frederick. Um, and so when I went for SPX, went back home i took my book to the to my original comic book shop where i where I, that i went to growing up and my book was in the shop and it, and nice, like i got them nice. to sell my book in the shop and i was like this is homecoming awesome. man like this nice, is what it's nice. about man <laughs> so yeah well our yeah. thing is with the indie comic exchange is that this is not a one and done inter interview um we're yeah, heading sure. towards our second um uh, turbo teaser and we'll obviously moving on through other versions of, of that you're heading to the the second so we're definitely going to find uh some time to get you back out here uh and talk about uh, relic hunter number two and even uh sharing more about your experiences and, and all that but i don't have anything else we'll let these good people get oh, back to you know one last thing i'm sorry i don't want to yeah, no worries no worries too 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 much um but uh, I'm also working on uh, something that's completely different. I'm working on a, a I did the cover for a uh, poetry book recently. Oh, wow. Nice. And I'm going to be working with the, uh, with the writer, uh, with the poet on uh, some romance comics. 
So because oh. I also am a huge John Romita fan. Yeah. And uh, love romance comics as well. Yes. And am a I, big too. Love and Rockets fan, as you can see. And uh, so, you know, you got to... You, I, I love all different kinds of things and there are lots of different projects that I want to do. And I would love to come back and talk to you guys oh, absolutely. later on this year about that as well, because Please. Um, independent romance comics, I think are, are really interesting. And I'm a big fan of, you know, the guys that make more modern yeah, comics we, in, the, in that realm as well. We could definitely talk about that one day because, uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize that uh, Simon and Kirby, no, Kirby and, yeah, Simon and Kirby uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Invent, invented the genre. I think it was 1949. Um, it, and uh, You got to get this book if you don't have it, guys. Oh, yeah. 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 And it's really not too expensive on, uh, I mean, I, I think I picked it up for like $25 yeah. on, uh, on Amazon super thick the art of simon and kirby and this is the kind of thing that you will get in it and i i know i'm like totally going over time with you guys but you know i mean like you know this type of stuff oh, wow. is oh wow yeah i got yeah oh, wow. i got i got this one on on closeout uh and uh it, ah, it yeah might, yeah it might it might overlap a little but this is the real early stuff it takes you from the very beginning what you're what you're doing there, they, they've been around for a while already. Oh, yeah. These are their big – I mean, like, guys, this book is so worth picking up because you'll see all sorts of stuff in here. I mean, like, yeah, ooh, know. this is – you know, and I mean, like, I'm a huge – I'm a huge Kirby fan. And so, like, you know, like old Boys Ranch comics and stuff. Yeah. And seeing the original art for this stuff is – it's not only just inspiring, but it's also uh, instructive in so many different ways. Um, yeah, that it, it's the uh, it's like the, um, the the African origin of humankind. And Kirby is like the uh, the origin of comic kind. You know. Yeah, man. It really, he really is. Yeah. And I mean, like, I have a big, I have a, a big and deep love for you know, EC comics and that kind of stuff and, uh, and the history of comics. So anyway, yeah. I could go I, on talking forever, but will, I really though. have enjoyed sitting with you guys. Good but that's, stuff, but that's two more times we're going to have you back. So. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I'm going to mark them. I'm going to mark them in my calendar and I'll be, you know, reach out, but yes, don't be afraid to reach out to us and, and we'll schedule something for, for that as well. But yes. Wow. What a, this was so overdue. Uh, Adam, I uh, absolutely, can't, I man. Can't thank you. I've been can't looking forward to it the last time. You know, I'm sorry that I missed it the no, last no, no, time no, no, that, no, we, no, that no, I wasn't no, able okay. to like. It's life. You know, it's life. It's life. And it's all cool. uh, I just wanted to thank you guys for for reaching out to me. And please well, do not forget to send me teaser two, man. Oh, you're on the list. And if you I need to buy list. it, I will buy it. Bro. <laughs> 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 all right. Well, thank you very much, and we will see you later. All right. Thanks, man.